OK, I'm going to talk about my JSON Analyze and Transform for Access application, commonly known as JATFA. Now, many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with JSON files already, but for those who aren't, a very quick summary. The JSON syntax is used for storing and exchanging data, and it's particularly used for supplying data from online sources. And the reason for that is it's a very efficient file format. It's also highly versatile. It allows rapid data transfer of a large amount of data in a relatively small file. They're just standard text files with suffix.json, and you can view them in any text editor. And it has its own syntax rules, which are fairly adaptable. Basically, everything is in pairs. The data is in has field names and field values separated by a colon and enclosed within quotes. Each pair of field names and values is separated by a comma. There are curly brackets and square brackets. The curly brackets hold objects and the square brackets hold arrays, and these are also in pairs. The file must always start with uh, usually a curly brace or sometimes with a square brace and must end with exactly the same type of bracket. And similarly, the number of opening and closing brackets of each type must match. Now, why did I create the app? Well, originally it was for my own use because I started using downloaded JSON data for several of my own free and commercial applications. But uh, unfortunately, Access is unable completely to import or to handle JSON files in any way at all. Excel has Power Query, and as I found out yesterday, Power Automate also is available to, to handle JSON files, but Access cannot natively do so. So before we can actually use JSON within Access, we need to process that data, commonly known as parsing. To make life more complicated, each JSON file has a, a unique and often highly complex structure. So therefore, each file needs a different method of handling. The idea of JAPFA is to manage this process in a completely automated way and to save data to normalize access tables that have been analyzed by the application. You can use the app with either save JSON files or direct from a website. And although the file syntax is ubiquitous in many places, there are unfortunately some cases where you get syntax errors and the app is able to fix many of those errors. So how does the application work? Well, the main steps are that first of all, we need to load the JSON file into memory. And remember, Access cannot even do that natively. The file is then analyzed. Field names are identified, data types are identified, and sizes where appropriate, and any subarrays containing uh, subsets of data are also detected. The program will then suggest a table or table structure, or in the case of subarrays, table structures, and then having approved that, you create the file, sorry, the program creates a transform function in order to populate those tables. This is all based on the file analysis. The function is then run and the data is imported into the tables that you've just created. Now, as I said, usually the process is completely straightforward and it's largely automated. However, if you wish to, you can modify the analysis and you can either ignore fields or add your own fields or change the table structure if it suits your need. To do so, you're treating the files as special cases. OK, I'm going to come out of that now and show you the program itself. Now, this is the main screen showing one particular JSON file, a simplified version of a bank statement, removing all personal details. It's a very busy screen, as you can see here. The, the program then gives you information about the file itself, where it's stored. Also, it suggests a table name based on the file name and a, and a name for the transform function that is going to be created, again, based on the file name. The actual file itself can be viewed in several ways, one of which is can collect the binoculars there. And as you can see then, we've got Notepad has opened and you can see a repeating structure with a bracket to start with, in this case, a square bracket. Then you've got the data for one particular record enclosed in curly braces. And there are four fields, date, description, amount and balance and a value for each. And then there's a number of, of repeated fields or uh, records there. Let's close that. 
Coming back to the main screen then, that same information is shown on the right hand side here, but it's in uh, compressed format. So if I click expand, you can see that more easily again, seeing the four fields of each record. Now, if I go to click on the, the table here, I haven't yet created a table and therefore right, it will then offer to create one for me. But I'm not going to do that yet because I want to actually show you the analysis part of the, of the uh, process. Now, when I click on the an Analyze JSON button here, it will immediately start to analyze the data. And it's so fast that by the time the anal analysis screen opens, it will be completed, as you will see here. So that didn't really give you an idea of how long it took. So I'm just going to remove that and run it again. And as you can see, it took about three seconds and you will remember that there were four fields. The program has detected there is no unique field amongst those. And so it's suggesting adding a, an auto number ID field and making it into the primary key, which I'm going to accept. Looking at the other four fields, date is obviously a reserve word in access and the program detects that and automatically suggests changing it to, in this case, the file name followed by date, so statement date. It's a date time field. The description field is just a text field and it's suggesting from analyzing a sample of the data that 100 characters will be sufficient. But if I wanted to, I could easily change that. The amount and the balance fields are both basically currency without a currency symbol being shown and the program is suggesting using a number double data type for that. You could probably get away with single but I'm going to stick with the double data type uh, for that in case we have any very large balances suddenly appearing. Okay so having accepted this I'm happy with this I'm going to create the table by clicking this button here And the, as you can see now, the table design primary key field being added by the program and the other four fields. And it's actually put in the description what each of those are. Nothing needed to be done by me at all. The program handled that by itself there. And if I just, sorry, just come back to that a second, just to make it clear that that table is at the moment empty. And it will remain empty because we need to create the transform statement. Now to do that, we click the SQL button here. The program will then say it doesn't exist or want to create it now. Yes, I do. It's been created again, it's instant and it opens direct to that. Now there are a whole series of transform functions already being created and all of them, like the one I've just created here, have exactly the same sort of structure. They start with an initial comment section here and an error handler is set up. The program times how long it takes when the function is run. We then have some initial housekeeping where we actually set up for parsing the data, message boxes, further housekeeping to count the amount of data that exists already and then delete it. I'll come back to that later and so on and so on. And until we get to here, all of the section up and to including the line important are common to every single transform state, function that's created by the program. And to save a lot of work, then that all comes from a template text file, um, which I can then just import straight into the statement that's created here. The next section is the part that is unique to this particular function and that is a record set to actually then loop through the data importing the four fields obviously the auto number fields is done by access and at the end of that we are ready then we to have the final section of the function and the final section comes from another template file clears the record set finishes the timing counts the number of records that have been added and then make it does a message box and again some error handling at the end so that's the function as i say standard for each particular json file that's used and now we're ready to populate the data so if i click transform data 60 records have been added the program opens that automatically and as you can see we've got the four fields and the auto number field added there and as you will notice then 
apart from just accepting the analysis that was done, I didn't need to do anything at all. It was still all done automatically by the program. So let me just now show you another JSON file. And this one is based on an API. If we go back to the main form, then Ideal Postcodes is a, an API used to actually give you the full postal addresses of a selected postcode uh, in the UK. In this case, a Bristol postcode BS25 5NB. I've already downloaded some data for that. This is the information shown here and there are 30 odd records in this particular postcode and there are a lot of fields that are supplied by the API. Many of those fields are going to be things that I don't need and I'll come back to how I handle that in a minute. So all of this from the result leading array here, all of that is just one record for one address. This is the data for the second address and so on. And if I click now on Analyze JSON, it's already been done. I'm not going to do it again. And the reason is I don't want to save a bit of time by actually just showing you what I've done to change that. I'm treating this as a special case. Again, the program has detected there is no unique key for a field for each of these records. So it's adding an ID number as a primary key field. We've then got a series of postcode fields. Many of those are irrelevant to me. And so I've unticked the ones I don't want to use. And you can see here, I've unticked more than half of these. The 38 fields in total, including that primary key field added by the program, and also two composite fields that I put in at the end here, just to show how you can actually do that as well. And what I've done with that is I've taken line one, line two, line three, and the postcode, and I've combined them together into an address line separated by commas, and I've done exactly the same thing as an address block for printing on envelopes and so on, okay, where I put each section in its own separate line. All of these are in one table again. It's a single array. The table has already been created, and you can see it's just got the fields that I actually want, not all 38 of those. And the transform function has also been created already. And if we look at this, we can actually see that was done some time ago. Same common structure at the beginning. I'll just skim over that down to important. Then the record set section, which is unique to this particular file. Then here you can see we've got some additional fields and including the address line composite field, which I'm constructing in a standard way, and address block field, where I've just replaced the commas with a carriage return. So that's the section that's based on the file analysis, and then the same common structure at the end. Let's come out of that. I could run that and repopulate the table, but it has already been done, so I'm just going to view that, and you can see the data for that particular postcode. Now, if I just close that and go back to the main form, one more thing to do with this, I'm just going to change that postcode and show you how quickly I can update this. And this is for a London postcode where the London I happens to be, SE17PB. And to update the data, then I'm going to click the Get button, and it's instantly updated that, as you can see. And there's a number of, of different addresses for that postcode as well. It's exactly the same structure, therefore I do not need to change the table, nor do I need to change the transform function. All I need to do is to click the transform button. And when I do that, it's going to warn me that the table already has records and it's going to, it will delete those. I'm going to say yes to that. It's now added those and as you can see, it has automatically imported the new data to the table. Again, all of that was automatic. I didn't need to do anything at all, although I did choose to make some additional fields, um, composite fields there as a special case there. OK, hopefully I've got time for one more file. And this one's slightly more complicated. 
It's one I got from the Mockaroo website used for constructing dummy data to my needs there. And it's one where I actually deliberately set up separate sub arrays. So it's a people table here. It's got it's such a program is suggesting that three tables are needed. And the reason for that is the main part of the data up into as far as password okay, is in the main table. Then there is a subarray email, in this case with four records in it, and there's a further subarray called IP address, in this case with one record in it. In the second record there, there are two emails and one IP address. But you can see then we need separate tables for each of those parts there. So we have people, email and address. If I go to the analysis part here, the analysis has already been done. I'm going to remove that again and just show you that although it's a slightly more complicated structure, again, the process is fairly quick. Five seconds this time. I'm going to accept that. And as you can see, this time it's a number field for ID because there were unique keys within each particular record, so it doesn't need to add them. Whole series of other fields here and going down as far as people, uh, sorry, as the password field, that's all in table one, the main table. Table two for email only, table three for IP address. The tables have already been created. That's the main table, primary key ID. The second table here, has got the ID field as a foreign key, as you would expect, so we can link them together. And similarly, the address table has got the ID field as a foreign key. So if we now look at the transform function, which has already been created, I'll, again, I won't do this again, same common starting point. When we get to the record set section, we have a separate record set loop for each table. That's the first table, table people, the main table. Table for the email there, including the foreign key from the first table there. And again, for the third table here, the, the IP address and the ID field has been inserted. And again, the same common structure. So if we now just have a look at this data here, I've already populated the table. Now, the first thing I do whenever I set up a new access database is to turn off sub data sheets. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I've added them. They're not automatically added by the program, but I've chosen to add them just so you can see that the data has been linked together for each of these records. And that's about it. The program can do far more. And as I said, I've used this in many of my own programs. And if we just come back to the slideshow just to say here's one of the examples on my website which is a free application for tracking changes in currency between different countries here okay i'll stop now thank you very much for your time